What could be damaging about that representation of God? You have a relationship based out of fear, which is ironic because fear is not from Jesus. It's a very appealing image of God to hold because that keeps me in control. You really want a God like that? Do you really want a God? It's just there serving you and whatever you want. You can't have that mm -hmm. and this image of God. They don't work together. Today we're talking about misconceptions with God. Do you have some of those? Chances are you do. And these misconceptions can actually be really damaging for our relationship with God. So what we're going to do is we're going to tackle head on some of these misconceptions about God, and we're going to actually combat them with truth. So let's talk about what a misconception of God is. So like when we have misconceptions, what does that look like? So we there's the actual God and then there's our vision of God. So give me some examples of misconceptions of God. I just can I just say that I like in the intro how you were like, you might have some misconceptions. Let me tell you, you do. <laughs> it's true. It well, it's true. Like we It's we, definitely true. Like uh, well, okay, maybe I'm just speaking for myself cuz I have carried. I'm probably more excited about this episode than I have been for just about any other because I have carried some of these very misconceptions we're going to talk about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it hurt my relationship with Jesus for a long time until I realized that I was disliking parts of Jesus that I had manufactured. Right. Mm -hmm. And yep. yeah. it was like, oh, so that's not who he is? Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, well, then I think it's better. I guarantee you that there's a lot of people out there that are, are similar to me that they have concocted, whether it's through their childhood or their adolescence or their, their adult life, they've concocted images or facsimiles of God that are not true. And that is what they're angry at. Yeah, That is what they're pushing away and saying, like, I don't want anything to do with that. And it's like, well, yeah, I wouldn't either, but that's not God. Mm. And I think if we can rid that yeah. for people and say, like, no, actually... Let's, let's let God, through his word, actually tell us who he is. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's one of the reasons why we don't know it. The, the, the reality is most people don't read the Bible. Mm -hmm. That's just the reality. And so um, it, you don't have anything to compare it to. You were asking why do we walk around with misconceptions about God is because we, don't have, we don't have anything to, to, to compare and contrast it to. Mm -hmm. And so if and it becomes your reality. It becomes the lens through which you kind of see the world, and everybody has their own little lens. And so, if you don't, uh, I don't. I don't know. It's like it's like if I'm walking around with my sunglasses all day, yeah, and I forget I have them on, until someone challenges that, mm -hmm. says, "Hey, you forgot to take your sunglasses off." So, anyways, I think it's um, we we never really have it challenged by anything else, and we just assume that's the way it. I, I think I, I think the primary way, maybe not the primary way. But, well, maybe it is, tends to be an interaction that someone has or had with a person who claimed to be a, a Christian, a follower of Jesus. And that interaction was um, left them with an impression about who that God that they say they serve, that they say they love, that they say that they're living in obedience to is really, truly like. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that that tends to be, then people make up their mind about, well, if that's kind of person is the person that, you know, if you're trying to become like the person you say you're following, then I don't want anything to do with the person you're following. Yeah. So, you know, how many people do we know that grew up in churches that were that were all about the rules? All about well, if you grew up in a church that's all about the rules, my granddad grew up in a church, they weren't allowed to play cards. They weren't they were told that was a sin. I don't know what Bible verse they found for that. I'm sure they found something, you know, from Leviticus or something. <laughs> it's like thou shalt not paper in hands, you know, or something like that means cards. That shall not play Uno. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, if that's the church, here's my point. If, you, if that's the environment you grow up in, without even looking at the Bible, you will make up your mind that God is a rule. He's more interested in the rules than he is about anything else. Yeah. You, so you'll just take that on. Um, if the only interactions you've had with a Christian are someone on the street corner screaming at people, you will take that on as your image then of, oh, so God is a screaming person who's really mad at, um, you know, people for not doing what he says to do or whatever. So I think that's primarily the way. Primarily people make up their, 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 their um, opinions about who God is and its character based on the people who say that they're following him and then just never challenge it. So let's, let's, let me go ahead and I'm going to say the first one. 
Okay. A lot of people. What believe, is this? You're, this is the first sort of misconception. Yep. Okay. This is the embodiment of what a lot of people believe about God. So and it, okay, got it. And, and this is a lot of people believe that God's personality is like mm -hmm. a mean school principal. Mm -hmm. So uh, they feel that God's this mean school principal. Now, what are some attributes of a mean school principal? So, by the I'll way, if you're listening and you're a school principal, not oh, every yeah. school principal notice, is mean. Notice, I said <laughs> I had some mean. great ones. I had some great ones. Oh, honestly, absolutely. Oh my gosh, my kids. But you're saying. The ones, though, we all know that image, too, of yeah. this. Yeah. Yes. So the first thing that you have when a mean school principal is that they are a disciplinarian first, foremost, mm -hmm. and ultimately. Yep. Second is that they are out. They're prowling, they're, they're prowling the halls looking for someone that's about to mess up, mm -hmm. and they're going to get them in trouble. They're also keeping a record constant mm. big book of records of all the things that you've done to make mistakes. Your permanent record. They're keeping track of your attendance. Yep. And when you don't show up, they're ready to slap the book at you. Yep. And they also play favorites, where it's like they have their chosen ones, but I'm not one of them. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people believe about God. Yeah, they do. I think, they, they, uh, I think this is a good one to start with because I think a lot of people think of God, first and foremost, as a very arbitrary figure for a um, deity or being or whatever it might be that's more concerned with getting people to behave certain ways um, than anything else. And I, I want to actually go back just one step and just say there's a really critical um, insight in the New Testament that we need to remember kind of going into this conversation. And, and it's from the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, where he gives this description of Jesus and he says, um, that Jesus came to the world. And he goes, no one has ever seen God. Now, this is why we try to find whatever. And he goes, but Jesus has made him known to us. That is a that is a foundational passage right there. Because what it's saying is, if you want to know the character of God, start with Jesus. Always start mm -hmm. with Jesus. He has made him known. Don't honestly don't start anywhere else. Even in the Bible, don't start anywhere. Like start with Jesus. He is the he is the demonstration of God's character in human flesh. So what was Jesus like? If you see what Jesus was like, if you see how did Jesus treat poor people? How did Jesus treat, was Jesus consumed with the rules? How did Jesus pe uh, treat uh, sinners? How, because however you see, that's how God does. That's God's character. Wow. So that's just an important thing to remember. And a lot of times we get people starting in the wrong place. It's Jesus. You have to start there in then Matthew, can, Mark, Luke, and John. I think that's a good accountability for even us in our discussion of is like, what is Jesus' representation that combats that's right. mm -hmm. each of these things? That's right. That's good. So, so, so okay. let's go back. Mean school principle. Yeah, mean school The principle. idea there that we, we grow up with or maybe that we've adopted is it concern with the rules, get it right, keep in score because principles keep attendance, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I guess they do. Um, and ready to kind of catch you when you mess up. So my question now is, what is the what could be damaging about that representation of God? What could be damaging, or how is that going to stunt things for your faith development if that's the image of God you have, you feel God personifies? I'll tell you exactly how. Um, it's a very rare person who has a personal relationship with their principle. They have respect for their principle, maybe. They have fear for their principle. They have some of them maybe, you know, for, uh, I'm talking about the mean, the yep. mean school oh, principal. Yeah. Yeah. Very few people have a personal relationship with their middle, uh, with their school principal. That's what's at stake. You think of God that way, you will miss the reality that what he wants most is a relationship, not rule keeping. Yeah. So that's what you miss. That's good. Yeah. And I think then you have a relationship based out of fear, yes. which is ironic because fear is not from Jesus. Like you can't you know love. I mean? With fear. Yeah. yeah. Yep. The, um, you know what another one is for me is you can't get away. You can't wait to get away from him. Yeah, mm. it's true. Like, so the thing with the music. You're ready for that bell to ring. Yeah. And it's like, I want to get away from, and you find peace outside the doors of that person's control. Mm -hmm. And so for some people, they have this image of God that, it, that God hates them, that God's angry with them constantly, that God's constantly judging them. And, the best way they can eliminate that is just eliminate God. Yeah. So, so here's what Jesus said. Remember, Jesus is the full representation of God in human form. 
And what Jesus said in Matthew 11 is the complete opposite of a mean school principle. What he said in Matthew 11 was, I have come to give you rest, not anxiety, not worry about am I keeping the rules, not, so, so if you think of God as always waiting to catch you, always waiting, keeping it, you will live an anxious life. First of all, you probably won't even stick with God, but if you try to, and then try to make the principle happy, you will be constantly anxious, always wondering if you've done enough. Did you get the grade? And that is the op, what Jesus actually said and, dist- and, and displayed in, um, in, in, rep, you know, in his incarnate form was, no, 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 I've come, my character is one that you can rest in. You're home, you're safe. I'm not waiting to catch you do bad. I'm empowering you to live right, not waiting for you to do, to mess up. Yeah, wow. and it's interesting because I think this one, maybe more than some of the other ones we're going to talk about later. This one I think also is the highest stake at then other people, you sharing that with other people or holding other people. This one's contagious. Yeah. Contagious. That's a good word actually. Cause it's interesting. I know I have friends who have then grown up in homes like this because this was their parents view Mm -hmm. of God and faith. Because I think this is just then the one that you want to hold everyone else to that those same standards. Yeah, because you're you're because you're, you're in fear. resentful. Well, and resentful. If I can't play, mm. no one else around me is going to. Yeah. yeah, like like people who are legalistic in this sense and try to keep the middle school, they don't feel comfortable with people who are free. Yeah, because and and they 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 can draw real tight lines. Yeah, because it's about keeping the rules, and I've totally. kept them. Yeah, and you haven't. Mm-hmm. And it's real easy to be self-righteous with this one. Yeah, and then like I think that then those people don't understand what a free person looks like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I think that that causes just a really interesting, yeah, legalistic dynamic. I think that's a good word. The For me, this without question was one of the, the ones that I carried with me for a very long time from my childhood. I remember believing that any mistake like kicked me out of favor with God. And so, like, any, any, any sin, both intentional or unintentional, was enough to, to like, and God was always playing, got you. Mm-hmm. And it did create a, a fear, not a, a, not a relationship of love, half as much as a relationship of God's out to get me. Yeah. And it does shape. And if it wasn't for the influences where I did get to see Jesus' love, oh, I would have bolted. Mm-hmm. Because that was pressure. Yeah. And, and it's also putting judgment in someone else's hands. Totally. And and nothing what Jason just described, uh, that was not my first image. My first image was often, you know, God's out to get you. Mm-hmm. Like, but in but I still loved God, but I was like, but I was uh, unnecessarily fearful. I do think there's a, some healthy fear of God. Well, and I think I was going to say, we'll talk about that, I think, a little bit yes, later. Yes, we are. Yes, we because are. this is not, see, you can swing the antithesis, was God doesn't care about anything I do. God's just my... Nope. Well, we'll talk about that, I think, yeah. in, in, in yeah, another another misconception. That's that's a pendulum swinging the wrong direction. Jesus was full of grace and truth, mm-hmm. yep. both, 100%. So we'll talk about that later. But, I mean, it's not just, oh, so the way to move past that misconception of an angry, angry school principle is just to go, oh, he, lo- he, he loves me no matter what I do. Mm-hmm. He does love you no matter what you do, but he will push you in directions for your good, and that will feel like discipline at times. But mm-hmm. we'll, we'll talk about kind of what yeah. that yeah. means. That yeah, and that's good. interesting. So mean school principle to me, like that's all truth. Yes, exactly. But no grace. They're not getting and, paid to be. And the motivation racial. is is enjoyment of the discipline, the, the discipline and the order, instead of the love and the uh, development of the the student. Yep. Whereas God doesn't do anything. Well, a youth pastor once told me, and this was a real freeing moment for me, as he goes, "Do you ever think about all of God's laws and God's commandments and everything that they all are for you, mm-hmm. for your good?" Yeah. He your, was like, yeah. do, you, "Do you ever just process that they're all f- to keep you safe?" Right. And I was like, I had never thought of that. I was like 14, and I was like, huh. Yeah. And we should say again, we're, we're very much uh, straw manning a very mean principle. There are <laughs> principles out there, because I, I know them, and yes. I'm, I'm thinking, oh, man, my friends who are principals, I know several who are listening, and uh, there are incredibly good ones who are way about grace and want to help the kids. So anyways, yeah. we're, oh. we're, remember, we're, 
we're doing the same thing here. We're, <laughs> we're creating a straw man, or not a straw man, but we're creating a yeah. caricature. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Last thing is favoritism. How this representation often says that like God has his favorites and he plays favorites. Yeah. Um, where do you, do you see that in the Bible? No. No, what you see in the Bible is everyone is on equal ground. That the, the, the very nature of grace and forgiveness puts everyone on the same playing field. The cross levels the playing field because in the cross and putting your faith in Jesus for you in the cross, the very nature of placing your faith in him is saying, I, have, I bring nothing. Mm -hmm. So if everyone brings nothing, there can be no favorites because every, everyone is completely, undeniably dependent on God's grace and nothing we've done. There yeah. can't be favorites. Wow. And it's interesting, mean school principles, like in Bible times, it just makes me think of like the folks that you'd read as like the religious leaders. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's like those folks who were the mean school principles of their day. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus came and leveled all that, like to mm -hmm. what you just said. And there's been plenty of pastors and Christians that have used the the laws of God as a chance to, for, to feel superiority. Mm-hmm. And to put themselves on a pedestal to make themselves feel better because of their own insecurities and stuff, and so we could we could play with that all day. So, um, so this is just not the hey, you know, the mean school. I mean, we keep going on all these levels. The mean school principles. Uh, uh, it's a very appealing image of God to hold because that keeps me in control because I can keep the rules because if it's the mean school principle, I still am a little bit in control of my own destiny because wow. I can keep the rules perfectly. See, when you throw yourself in the arms of grace, you're, you're saying, I cannot keep the rule. I'm not good enough. That's why some people don't want it, because it means you have to admit no good thing you've done is good enough. Mm -hmm. And you've kept, and some people are like, I've kept my nose clean for 40 years. It's like, yeah, and it's not good enough. Yeah. Not, not to God. So you need grace. Mm -hmm. And so anyways, that's why that one's appealing. Yeah. We mm -hmm. still get to be in control a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the self-preservation. Mm -hmm. Like it's easier to self-preserve when you can be in control of the rules. Yep. That's so true. So final thought on mean school principle. Again, mean school principle. Uh, well, final thoughts, Jace or Joanna. Like what characteristics and truths about God does just dispel this representation? So like put a, put a cap on it. What are, what are, what are the images of God it, it revealed to us through Christ that just, blow this out of the water and we shared some but fine uh, final uh, thought I, I would just go back to the i go back to matthew 11 i'd say i'd say go to that passage to dispel this one that jesus said i came to give you rest not i came to make you keep the rules that's good that's what i'd go back to yeah the uh, let's move on to our next uh, misconception about god which is the absent-minded lifeguard representation so again no offense to lifeguards but um <laughs> Let's just clarify. Not all lifeguards are absent-minded. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've been to pools, though, in recent years, and it's staffed by some, like, nine-year-old who's <laughs> just, just like, flipping a whistle yes. around their finger. And yeah. honestly, I've been like, I better... I better keep a close eye on the pool because totally. I don't trust Jimmy. Yeah. Oh, uh, totally. Who just was done playing with Legos seven <laughs> minutes ago. That's because you're old and everyone looks yes. young to you now. That Jimmy was probably 19. <laughs> he was probably 19. <laughs> yeah. So this uh, this image of, uh, let me paint the picture of the, the absent-minded lifeguard. So the absent-minded lifeguard is high atop what's going on. He's mm. not in the pool with us. Mm. He is overseeing what we're doing. He would he doesn't swim with us. He doesn't get in the water with us. And he he's, might if there's some trouble, but, but for the yeah. most part No 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 I'm I'm got you. I, I yeah, yeah. And, keep going. And he also uh is not interested in he's gonna just let most things slide. Yep. You know, running, pushing, drowning, you know, like drowning's probably the <laughs> only thing that's gonna activate him. Yeah, but, hopefully. but, but I hope so. he just doesn't seem to yep. to, yeah, yeah. to pay a whole lot of interest unless you bother him. Yep. And he really doesn't want to be bothered with what's going on in the pool. Just just don't kill each other in there. Don't bother me. I'm way up here. Yeah. So it's so it's the idea of God being remote. Uh yes. Uninterested. Aloof. He'll, he'll pedal uh, or maybe meddle or get into our business. Um yeah. when it, when things go pretty bad or or when we're off track a little bit, when we're splashing a little bit too much, but for the most part, this is the big man upstairs. Right. I mean, Absolutely. this is kind of that idea. This is 
the old man in the sky. Yeah. Yeah. And, and almost inter like when we interrupt them. Oh, and we're a bother. Yeah. It's yeah. like, then that's when they get involved. Yeah. And I think that that, yeah. Yeah. It, and this is, there's no relationship with this God either. I mean, this God is, is just, uh, oh, I keep using the word aloof, but maybe yeah. another word would be, um, disinterested. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like he's disinterested in us. Yeah. So where's this one come from and, and how have you seen this representation uh, affect people's relationship with God? I think this one's pretty common, actually. I So this one seems... Um, I, I don't know if this is right, but here's how it strikes me. I, I feel like people who grew up in religious homes, um, maybe that first one can sometimes be a little bit more creeped in. I feel like people who didn't and it's all, I feel like this second one tends to be, at least in my conversations with people, come out a little bit more like, well, if there is a God, um, I'm sure God's not real interested in mm -hmm. the details of my life. Or It's the big man upstairs. This one's portrayed a ton in the media. Um, it's, it's a deity. There's something. This is, a, I want to thank God at the end of all the Grammys. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's not personal. It's just more... Whatever that thing is that makes life got me this award, yeah. <laughs> you know. What I mean, yeah. so I th I think this one's pretty common for people who don't have a ton of religious background, um, and then even uh, honestly, people who've been Christians for a long time probably at some point can be like, "God, are you even around?" That's mm -hmm. that. Like, do you only are you only interested when I'm splashing too much? Yeah, or it's just even the potentially the transfer of like. Well, if I don't interrupt you, you're not interrupting me. Like, we both, like, know our roles, right? We have a, right? a, a deal, yeah. Yeah, it's like, cool, you guard the pool, and I'm going to promise not to drown, and then yeah. we won't have to yeah. interact. Oh, totally. That's good. So what's what's damaging about this? What what is What happens when you embrace this image of God? God is not your butler. God is not your... Jesus makes demands. Jesus calls us to narrow roads. Jesus calls us to lay down our lives and pick up the cross. So, so this sort of D is, you know, this sort of God's out there and you can help me when in, you know, whatever, maybe you'll get involved. It misses the number one, the, what's the word? Not the challenge, but it misses, uh, it, it misses the invitation that Jesus does in calling us up to something greater. Yeah. No lifeguards doing that. It's like, as long as you just don't mess up the pool, you're fine. Mm -hmm. Um, so it misses out on that and it misses again, the relationship. God is personal. That's the number one thing this one misses yeah. is that God is personal. He knows your name. He knows everything about you. He knows, as it says in the Psalms or Jesus quoted that every hair on your head, like that's how intimately involved he is in your life. Um, and so that's what this one misses. It misses the intimacy of God. Yeah, that's great. Like that you just said the intimacy of God, because that's exactly what I was feeling. It's like the niceties without like interpersonal mm -hmm. where it's just like, hey, you stay in your lane. I'm going to stay in mine. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm just going to stay under the radar is yep. I feel like what I, I'd feel a little bit with that one, too. But missing out on the depth or yep. the. um, Yeah, the fullness. Yep. Yep. So I think it misses those two things. It misses intimacy and it misses the reality that um, Jesus isn't there to serve us. Mm -hmm. he, we exist to serve him. Uh, I was just looking at a couple different passages, but one of the other things for me is the fact that he swims with us. Mm -hmm. And this That's is good. embodied by Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. yeah. is the fact that God... Uh, this, is uh, this, this is the incarnation. Yes. Yeah. Like Romans 5, 8 says, you know, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah. He came while we were still in the pool. Yeah. While we were still, you know, in the mess and everything, he he hopped in with us. He's not up there blowing the whistle. Mm -hmm. He's down there with us. And and so much of the New Testament talks about the fact that this is a God that enters into the story with us. Yeah. Uh, and I can't. I Joanna, you've shared some some beautiful stories of like your wrestle with God through things, and I can't imagine any of those stories make any sense if you have an image of God as this absent-minded lifeguard. Yeah. You don't have the beautiful things that you've written in your journal and about, you know, life and everything. You can't have that mm -hmm. and this image of God. They don't they don't work together. Totally. Yeah. I'm trying to find another passage here, Philippians, and I, my phone's not 
working. But Philippians 2, oh, there it is, um, says this about Jesus. So again, this is the counter to that, right? Uh, you must have the same attitude as Christ Jesus had. Okay, well, what was that? Well, here it is. He says, verse 6, chapter 2, Philippians 2, 6, though he was God, he, he's, he's, he's there, right? He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and took the humble position of a slave, a servant, and was born as a human being. He got in the pool with us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's personal. He, he didn't cling to all of that. He was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to, to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. So that's, that's the reality. Yeah. That's who Jesus shows God to be. The God who comes into the pool, who's right beside us, who swims with us, like you said, I love that, um, and who's intimate in every way. Yeah, uh, and and this one is is one of my favorite, you know, d- things to dispel about God because mm-hmm. ultimately, the good news that you get to inform people of on this one is really exciting. Yeah, in yeah. the fact that like, oh, let me tell you about this God that is teaching you how to swim. Yeah, but not blowing the whistle to teach you how to swim, but literally holding you. Like I used to hold my son and daughter to teach them how to swim and be like, "Hey, you see, you, like it's it, we could <laughs> we could probably go too far with the illustration, but an intimate God that loves us." And mm-hmm. this is depicted. Don't take my word for it. It's throughout the Bible. This intimate God that like uh, burdens himself with the plights of our world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. So. Uh, last thing is the old hippie now, and this is one of my favorites. Um, I say favorites cause I like the image, but, um, I just pictured a bad Halloween costume. <laughs> now imagine that young person is in a Halloween costume, but aged like 50 yeah. years. That's, that's the old hippie. The old hippie is everything's peace. Everything's love. Everything's kosher. Everything's groovy. Everything's fine. This is this is definitely one I think for young adults today. I do too. Yeah, where it's like, dude, it's like if God is love, yeah. why would God have a problem with this or that? Why would the Bible, you know, whatever? And and the, this image of God is is really pervasive mm-hmm. on college campuses. Really mm-hmm. pervasive, you know, with in high school. It's really pervasive because uh, I do think there was a message and teaching for a generation. It, from 90s into the early 2000s, where we were penduluming mm. from the mean school the, principle. Yeah, from the, you can't play with cards. My yeah. Paul, my, my Paul, Paul, yeah. Penduluming to the other side, which is everything's groovy, man. God loves, God loves it all, you know, and that is, as I would argue, as destructive of a misconception about God as the mean school principle. It's also a misconception about love. Like, love doesn't let anything go. Now, we fundamentally know that mm-hmm. because no exi- no human relationship that, that you would say is loving doesn't also have boundaries. It doesn't also have those kinds of things. Like, nobody would look at a parent who says, I love my kids, so I let them do whatever they want mm-hmm. and think that that parent is fit to be a parent. Yet, so it's really a we don't want to be under submission to a God when we, yeah. when we um, I think, adopt that. But we, but we know love doesn't do that. So it's a, it's kind of a, it's it's kind of our convenient way around facing the facts that if God is God, God can make demands of us, like yeah. like a parent would for their own their kids' own good. So it's interesting. It's it's we say he's love, um, and but to say then to make the jump that that means anything I do, he's good with. That doesn't make logical sense in any other relationship. Like that's what I mean. We fundamentally understand that. So uh, that parent would go to jail if they if they said, "I'm just loving my kid." Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just let them get away with everything. Yeah, I mean, they'd be in prison. Yeah, but we like to think of God that way. Well, and that's what we were talking about earlier. This one to me feels like all grace, no truth. Yep, it's the pendulum. And so yeah, it's the pendulum just back to all grace, no rules. And I do think there's a lot of people, but I think the the problem with this one is you don't trust this God. Hmm. You don't care. You don't assume mm-hmm. this God is going to carry something heavy for you. There's no reason to because yeah, there's no bending on, flexing on, adapting on your part. Yeah. I mean, like, this is a God who caters to you. You really want a God like that? It, like, like, I mean, do you really want a God that is just there serving you and whatever you want? Like, I don't think you do. 
I mean, that, that, that's not a worthy God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you can't put your footing on this God. You can't put your, your trust in this God because it also, this God changes. This God changes his opinion. Yeah. This God changes truth like, you know, other people change shoes. Yeah. And this God is not a, a God that we can call to, uh, call to in our moment of, of trial. Like, I, this, this God is, is too amoeba like for, well, for me. It's interesting because then in the garden, it could have played out with Jesus not dying on the cross because mm-hmm. it's like, oh, well, man, that's like not what's best for me. Like, mm-hmm. God, can I do it another way? And it's like, oh, yeah, like, if it's not good for you, that's fine. You know, I, so I just like even what, yeah, I don't know. I just, yeah, that is not the God yeah. that I know the character of. What is, so what's, why is this need to be rooted out, Jason? Um, because God is holy and transcendent and completely other. And if that's true, then it would be impossible for that God to cater to us, I guess. And it doesn't make logical sense. And so what's at stake is we, what's at stake is we, 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 we reduce, we make God real small with this one. He's tiny. He's our, he's our buddy. He's there to support me. You, what's at risk is you're putting yourself at the center of the universe mm-hmm. and not God. Ooh. Because if God is there just to affirm in my life and make me, then, then I'm the one who's in, I'm the God. Mm-hmm. He's my, he's my um, chauffeur, you know? So that's just not the way that Jesus reveals. The, 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 in Revelation, the book of Revelation, Jesus is with with hair of white fire, our eyes with fire and a sword on his side. And don't think vengeance and violence, think power and authority and holiness and complete. Um, it will make you fall on your knees. Well, that passage we read earlier, Philippians, how it ends. And one day Jesus will return and every knee will bow. You're not bowing to the God who just, whatever you want to do. You're not bowing to that God. That God you're saying bows to me. That is not Jesus. Jesus is like, you will bow to me. <laughs> Everyone will at some point, willingly or unwillingly. I just want it to be willingly. Mm-hmm. That's, and, and, and I think it is important to have this because it's like, I, and I loved how you started, Jason, with just the simplicity of you, you need to have a God that is giving you some boundaries, some cosmic boundaries that have to be honored, that have to be adhered to. And he didn't leave them vague or amoeba-like. He said, these are the boundaries. He gave them to us in his word. He gave us a representation of those boundaries in Jesus Christ. And that's important because and we, we do the same thing with our children, where it's mm-hmm. like, you know, and we may not understand. And so that's what I want to get at is if, if, it was, if everything was wavy-gravy and really cool and, you know, it's just fine what you do, and the kids go do what you want, uh, go put your put the the fork in the light socket. The kid doesn't understand that this is actually hurting you. The kid doesn't understand eating ice cream twenty four seven is causing you diabetes, overweight. You know it's going to lessen your life. It's going to do all these things. And in the same way that when we put these kind of things on God, well, we want God to just be whatever is cool. The problem is is leading us to destruction because we're not honoring the actual just facts, the cosmic facts of what we need in life. And so when we adapt whatever we we suddenly just pick and choose what we got want God to to be, all of a sudden we are going to come to ruin because we're not listening to the wisdom and and the the holiness of this God. Yeah. There is a propensity to make God cave to the pressures of society in this moment. There is is uh, there's Christians. Or, or my own will. Or yeah, my there's own. Christians that are like, well, this wasn't acceptable 50 years ago, but now it is in society, so we must make it acceptable to God. We must meet, We must find a way of making God kosher with this. Mm-hmm. So what, how do we as Christians stand firm in knowing that you know God doesn't bend to societal pressures or the changing of times and not everything is okay and not everything is just love? I would just say go back. I, I mean, I don't mean to sound cliched on this or oversimplify it. Again, the standard is Jesus. So if 
I mean, the majority of people who are saying that have never spent a good amount of time, if any, in the New Testament or in the Gospels. It's my guess. I'm not trying to be judgmental of that. That's just been my experience. People who talk like that, I'm like, you've never read the Bible, have you? You've never read the screen? No. Or they know just like a few th- things. That, again, this is our, this is our uh, guy. I mean, who does Jesus reveal himself to be? And when you look at the Gospels, you cannot come away. Um, how did, I think Tim Keller kind of said it this way. He's like, you can't read the Gospels and go, those were nice ideas. It's impo- like, they're either, he was crazy, or he is the son of God and you need to bow to him. Mm-hmm. But you can't come away like, oh, wasn't that nice? It wasn't nice. It was, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It was, um, if even lust, if even your hand causes you to lust, and your eye causes you to then cut it off and gouge it. Like, there is a way of being I'm calling you to. You know, he's using this hyperbolic language. My point is he keeps calling up, not bending down to you. He keeps calling us up to who God made us to be. So you can't read, so I'd say, go read the Gospels again and again and again, and you'll see real quick that he doesn't bend to us. He doesn't bend to us because it's not what we need. It's not what we need. Any more than your kid needs you, you know, if you're a parent, to uh, cater to their every need. What they need is for you to love them enough to discipline them at times, to guide them, and to tell them you stick your fork in that and it will electrocute you. It will lead to ruin. Well, that's not very loving. Oh, uh, yeah, it's the most loving thing. It's the most loving thing to tell you the truth. If you know someone that's got this image of God, this misconception of God that is kind of, you know, messed with their relationship, I would encourage you share this particular episode with them so that they can start to have some of these these beliefs and these misconceptions challenged. Uh, as always, you know, like, subscribe, share, leave comments. All that helps us get this podcast and this good news out to more and more people. But as always, you know, now that you're a life changed by Christ, go live that change out.